Uh, thanks a lot to all of you for uh, participating in this workshop. It has been amazing the whole week. I learned a lot of new things. So as uh, the last speaker of the conference, I have the pleasure to summarize all the talks. No, joking. So I'm going to tell you about um, a work which uh, is in this papers with, with amazing collaborators. So the, the people in green are somewhere in the room or used to be in the room at some point in the workshop. And then there'll be a little bit mentioning of, of, of some um, coming work in progress. Okay, so the motivation slide is not really needed in this workshop. The basic idea is that as, as you've heard in many talks, we have um, uh, many, many calculations of, of um, kind of exact correlation functions, observables in QFTs with, with different amount of supersymmetries in various dimensions. And one thing that you can hope is that in some, some appropriate large n limit, these calculations can make contact with uh, type 2a or type 2b supergravity. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, with corrections to, to the supergravity limit. So eventually, contact with some kind of um, quantum gravitational theory. OK, and so the goal of the talk is much more modest. Uh, I will kind of explain on a couple of examples how all of this works to leading order in n and lambda, OK? So in the supergravity approximations. And in the talk, I will not have um, conformal symmetry. So the kind of examples I'm going to study are, will be d-dimensional QFTs on, on a round sphere. So no squashings, no other topology, none of that. Uh, and the kind of examples will be deformations of the maximally supersymmetric 4D theory with um, different amounts of supersymmetry, or uh, the maximally supersymmetric young mills theory in dimensions between 2 and 7. So those will be the um, concrete examples I'm going to study. Good, and I want to emphasize that in, uh, in, in kind of example one and three, we do have a lot of um, calculations with supersymmetric localization, but example one concerns an n equals one QFT, so massive theory on a four sphere, for which as far as I know, there's no published at least results for uh, QFT observables, exact observables. Okay, good. Okay, so what's this um, kind of examples I'm going to talk about? So uh, this is an overview of um, kind of n equals four young mills. So the content is a gauge field, some scalars in the adjoint, and fermions in the adjoint. And I can decompose all of this into multiplets of n equals one supersymmetry, uh, which will be a vector and a bunch of chirals, all of these in the adjoint. And so this thing has an SO6R symmetry in general at the conformal point, but of course in this um, formulation I, I only have an SU3 times U1 manifested. And so the deformation I would like is to turn on superpotential masses for the chiral superfield. It's kind of an obvious deformation that you can study and people did a lot in the past. So the new kind of ingredient is that I'll do this on S4. So this is how we connect to the topic of the workshop. And so um, if you want to do this, you are kind of, uh, kind of immediately faced with, a, with an obstacle that um, I have a massive theory on S4, so I don't have conformal invariance anymore. And it's not obvious how I'm going to couple it on S4, um, preserving supersymmetry. Well, when there is a will, there is a way. And that's the way, basically. So what I've written over here is the Lagrangian, schematically, of n equals 1 star on S4 uh, with all of these masses turned on. So the couplings in red are superpotential masses. And the couplings in blue are due to the fact that I'm on the sphere. So if I take m m i to zero and r very large, I'm back to the flat space conformal theory. Okay, so 
localization s seems to work in the case when M3 is zero and M1 is equal to M2. So this is known as N equals to two star theory and this is actually a um, kind of example in the Peston's original paper on localization for gauge theories on S4. Okay, so I'm gonna focus for the next um, five slides or so on this, this kind of example, okay. Good, so this is a slide which most of you would know about. This is essentially borrowed from Peston's paper. So the localization answer is that the partition function on S4, for this example, n equals two star, with, with an SUN gauge group, uh, uh, the path integral localizes to a matrix model of a kind, where I have to integrate over the uh, kind of eigenvalues of, of this adjoint scalar, uh, AI, and this is the measure in black, and I have a one loop piece and an, and, and an instant on piece and a classical piece. So I've spelled out the classical contribution and the one loop one. The, the instantons are harder, so this is known as a necros of partition function with some specific values of the epsilon parameters. And so for me, this will not be an important player. And because what I'm interested in is, is a large n limit, and the common law is that at large n instantons don't contribute, but this is not entirely obvious. And so these people, Zagan Bonnie Russo, studied exactly this matrix model in the, the large n limit as a function of the coupling lambda, okay? So I still have a parameter and, and interesting things can happen as a function of this parameter. And so one of the um, arguments in their paper is that at large n instantons are not gonna be um, contributing and if you wish them calculations I'm gonna show later on, give you further kind of argument for this, holographically. Yes. Yes, but I don't know how the, the instant on moduli space volume a priori scales with n, right? So it could be that I have an exponentially smaller factor and then the volume grows with n in an exponential way, at least in principle. So. I'm cautious here with this. But of course, that's the usual argument is, is what we said. Okay, so in addition, I'll be interested in this um, dependence on lambda only when I'm in the large lambda limit because eventually I'd like to simplify and calculate in supergravity. So as a function of lambda, things are complicated and interesting and I encourage you to open up these papers which are beautiful, I think, but I'm interested in this limit where I do have an analytic answer for the uh, path integral or the log of the path integral, which I'll call the free energy on the force here. So that's the answer, but since all of you have had a QF team course, you should be bothered. I have a gamma here, which is a kind of an artifact from the fact that I've calculated all of this with some scheme, regularization scheme. I think this one is dim rec, but doesn't matter. I have dependence on the scheme in this final answer. And so I should be um, aiming to understand what is the scheme independent part of the free energy. And the answer can be formulated over here. So if I differentiate this F three times with respect to the dimensionless mass, so the natural parameter is dimensionless M times the radius of the sphere, then this answer in the box should be independent of the scheme. That's what I'm saying, basically. And then in addition to the um, path integral, I can kind of insert a um, BPS Wilson loop, which we heard about on Monday from various speakers, and this one uh, is half BPS. It's compatible with the supercharge used for localization, and it has an expectation value given over here, okay? So these two things in the box, I should be able to calculate at large n and large lambda, which means in the supergravity limit, okay? And that will be my goal for the next 10 minutes or so, okay? Any questions or complaints?
Good. So how do we do this? Well, the, it's a long and arduous road, but uh, we know how to do this, that upshot. So what I'm gonna do is I'll construct a 5D solution of 5D supergravity, maximal SO6 gauged supergravity, which will be the bulk dual of this uh, deformation of n equals four angles. So the reason I, I wanna be in 5D is that it's kind of easier than in type 2B. And one of the, uh, how to say, justifications for this is that type 2B on S5, if you only keep the lowest KK modes, is a consistent, so this 5D theory is a consistent truncation of the lowest KK modes of type 2B on S5, which was proven in 2014, but it was expected already in the mid 80s. Uh, and in addition, if I want to ask exactly this um, holographic um, question, but on R4, uh, it was already answered by Phil and Warner in uh, 2000, I think, and so both of these are motivations for me to work in five dimensions instead of uh, in 10 dimensions, which is harder. Okay, so what I have to do is I have to carefully analyze the symmetries of this uh, deformation of n equals four, and I have a u1 uh, times u1 symmetry of this deformation in the Lagrangian, classically. In addition, uh, there is an additional subtle U1Y, which is um, kind of emerging at large N. It's a subgroup of, of the SL2R or SL2Z duality group of N equals four. So it has been argued in 98 that, that it's an emergent large N symmetry of N equals four and mills, and, and it's also present in this model. Okay, so if I, impose all of this on 5D n equals 8 supergravity, what uh, comes out is that I have to keep the metric and some scalar fields, three of them. Uh, two of the scalars are dual to two specific operators, so a bosonic bilinear and a fermionic one, and these are the usual superpotential masses which I'm adding on, on flat space. In addition, though, I have a third scalar, chi, which is dual to another uh, bosonic bilinear operator, which I only have if I'm on S4. It, it's an additional coupling which I have to add on S4. And so if I kill this last one, I'm back to flat space and I, I should um, recover the well-known uh, 5D model of Pilk and Warner. Okay, so this is the basic setup. And so, this is the model with the metric and these scalar fields in 5D. It comes out of the 5D n equals 8 supergravity after a long calculation, but doesn't matter, that's the final model. And I parameterize the scalars as a real scalar and two complex scalars, but I'm reminding you that I'm in, on S4, and so these are really two kind of independent scalars, and that's why I call them tilde here instead of bar to remind you of that. Okay, so with, in this model I'm after backgrounds which have an isometry of S4 because I'm on S4 which is round. So in the metric I can only allow for a function A of R. This is the radial of anti Sitter space and then I have a bunch of scalars which could also have profiles as a function of R. Okay, good, so what do I have to do? I have to put this ansatz in, in, into the BPS equations of the 5D supergravity of this model. And then I have to work a bit. Uh, and I think this is, all of this is kind of standard and the only new or different ingredient as compared to flat space is that I have to use a different spinner on S4. It's not covariantly constant, it's not a constant spinner, it's a conformal killing spinner of sort, this one here. And then with this at hand I can derive BPS equations, and they look like this. So the um, equations in red here are differential equations for the scalars, and they form a closed 
system of uh, first order uh, ODEs. And if I have a solution of these, I can just put it on the right hand side over here and find the metric function. So this last one is, is in a sense automatically solved. It's, it's telling me how the metric evolves as a function of R. So unfortunately, we couldn't analytically solve these equations. Uh, we are not very strong, it seems. Uh, but we can do numerics, and we can also do kind of an expansion in the UV and in the IR. So we did all of this. I'm going to spare you the details. The upshot is that in the UV, at large values of R, um, the BPS equations have two kind of integration constants, which is absolutely kind of expected in holography. I have a mass or a source for all of these operators, which is one parameter mu. And then I have a VEF. And so the VEF is determining the state, and so it's a free parameter. But in the IR, I'm on S4, so I should have determined, in a sense, the state. And so we kind of expect that this mu is due to MR, the, the dimensionless combination, and this V should somehow be determined by the condition in the IR on the geometry. And so what we did is we kind of imposed that as you go into the IR, this S4 smoothly caps off into topologically R5. So it's, it's uh, metrically also R5. It's, it's a smooth capping off of the, of the 5D space. And, and, and if you do this, what happens is that this uh, VEV is determined by the mass or the mu in this way. So we have an analytic expression for how the VEV is determined uh, in terms of the source and comes out from imposing this regularity condition. In addition, we can go through the normalizations of various fields and so on and map to kind of operators on the boundary and you find that mu is i times mr. So indeed, mu is uh, connected to the source in the field theory. Okay, uh, so this is essentially kind of input from the BPS equations that I need to calculate things holographically. Uh, so what I'm interested in is this um, function f, which is the free energy, and we know since 20 years ago how, how, how to do this. We just have to evaluate on shell action of this 5D solution, and this should be the, the path integral or the free energy of, of the dual QFT. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how to say this, but uh, this works, of course, up to divergences because, you know, at large R, I have divergences which I have to cancel, which are the usual divergences I have to cancel in a QFT. We know how to do this systematically due to Costas and many other people. Uh, and the only issue here, or subtlety, I should say, is that in addition to this, in addition to canceling divergences, you can still have finite counter terms with coefficients which are free. So here I have a supersymmetric theory, so I should insist that I, I'm adding all of the finite counter terms which are necessary for uh, supersymmetry. And if you do this, you should be able to compute kind of unambiguously this quantity. And indeed, it is possible to do this analysis. If you're not willing to discuss these counter terms, meaning if you allow for an arbitrary coefficient, of course, I cannot compute this unambiguously. I have to go to more derivatives and get rid of the counter terms, which I don't know. This is just a technical point. So all of this is, is unfortunately also long and arduous, so I'm going to spare you the details, but the upshot is kind of simple. I have this 5D model, the classical Lagrangian which I showed you, to which I have to add the counter terms, the usual one, the divergent ones that Costas instructed us how to compute. And then I have to add also a finite, a specific finite counter term, which we can discuss after the talk if you want. Uh, and then this action I sh should evaluate on shell, on the background which I uh, calculated before. And if you do this, what happens is that the third derivative of this on-shell action is actually 
simply the second derivative of, of the function v, of this vev function, as a function of mu. And so it turns out that all of this mess boils down to a simple answer, which, which, is, which is over here. And of course, uh, if you put now mu is i m r, you can see that this answer here compares favorably with uh, supergravity. So I get, I get a match. So all of this amounts to just holography just works in this example, which is good. Okay, uh, any questions on this? Yes. Right, so uh, physical meaning uh, is, is, is a bit hard. So people have understood in some cases what's the physical meaning on R4 of a, of a path integral on S4 as a function of marginal couplings. But over here, I have function of relevant couplings. So it, it's some integrated correlation function. But I don't have like a clean answer of a physical meaning. What I know is that it's scheme independent and it's a good observable. What that observable is on R4, yeah, I'll pass out on that. I don't know. Okay, so uh, we, we have matched the path integral, the free energy with localization, but we can do a bit better. Uh, we, we can also calculate the Wilson line expectation value. Unfortunately, to, to do this requires uh, two amazing collaborators. Fortunately, requires two amazing collaborators. Unfortunately for them, it's a lot of work. So what we have to do is uh, to evaluate um, a non-selection of a probe fundamental string in, in a type to bin background, which is, which is an uplift of this 5D background, which I showed you. So the first exercise, which is long and painful, is to construct a type 2B solution, which is an uplift of this 5D solution. So over here, I don't want to scare you, but that's the formulas we had to deal with. It's, this is the type 2B metric. So, it's a, so the first line is the 5D metric I showed you. Then when you uplift, you get a warp factor, and then you have a topological S5 over here written in god-awful coordinates with some squashings. So all of these functions are determined in terms of the scalars in five dimensions. So this Z and Z tilde and eta are the 5D scalars. And okay, that's only the metric, okay? Uh, in addition, we have all of the fluxes in two beam turned on. Axiom, dilaton, two form, five form. All of them are on and, and, and we have all of them uh, they fit on a couple of pages, okay? So if I kill one of the scalars, so if, if I take z tilde is equal to minus z, this is the, the model that Hill and Warner studied uh, 18 years ago, and of course all of this collapses to a much nicer uh, formula which they had in their paper. Okay, so I have a background, I have to do now the calculation of a probe fundamental string. That one is not so hard because the supersymmetric string wants, wants to sit at a particular locus on S5 and it's wrapping the kind of equator on S4. And so the configuration of the string is kind of simple. So most of this mess collapses to something nice. Uh, and so w what I have to do, which we did in the paper in detail, is to, to use the number go to action, calculate it on shell on this profile of the string, regularize it, again, with a simple counter term, and then uh, this must be the log of the Wilson loop expectation value. And indeed, it happens. So w w when you do all of this, you obtain this on shell action, regularized. And here is, so we have this numerically, right? So all of this is numerical. Uh, and so the numerics fit with this function in this way. So I don't even know which one is which. So one of them is, a, is the function, the other one is our numerics, but they lie on top of each other. So for all practical purposes, they're the same function. And so, of course, 
this function matches the localization. Uh, and I want to emphasize that over here, I'm, I'm assuming that mu is real. I don't have to assume that. We have arbitrary complex mu. These are complex saddle points in general. And so we have checked all over the complex plane that the two functions match. But this one is only a real section, if you wish. OK, any, any questions? Yes. Yes. Very good. So what happens is that because I'm, I'm insisting on this special one half BPS Wilson line, it has to be on the um, a big circle of S4, and in the bulk it just wraps all of the space. It, it goes down all the way to the, to the pinching point, to the regular point. But indeed, generally, if I allow other profiles, it will be a mess, and I have to calculate it again. This one is obviously special. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, well. I'm not sure if, okay, the, the usual answer I can give is that, that I'm at large n, so I'm in some kind of thermodynamic limit, so uh, things sh should not be, could not be analytic, right? So the observables don't have to depend analytically on the parameters, but I'm not sure if I can give any more concrete answer. Uh, in the bulk? I don't know of any. We've tried that. So it will require identifying how these BPS equations know about mu. But as I've told you, the BPS equations in the UV depend on both mu and V. And it's only if I integrate them out to the IR that I see a relation between V and mu. And I don't know how to avoid this kind of, kind of integral. Yeah. So it's hidden, if you wish, in this kind of integration into the IR, which I have to do uh, from the supergravity perspective, yes. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yes. Right, so you're, you know what to ask, so that the, those are the subtle questions. So all of these saddle points in the bulk, I think that's my opinion, uh, sh should be thought of as complex settles, and they should not be analytically continued in any way to Lorentzian signature. And so in this case, if you change mu to not being real or something like this, you, your fluxes could pick up i's. So the, the b2 and the c2 flux become imaginary because some of the 5D scalars become imaginary or complex in general. They're not, but each of them is complex. Nothing is real. It's only the metric is real by some magic, and, and, and only the 5D metric is real. So the uplifted one is not. So it's a fully complex set of points in the box. Okay? So you should think of this geometry as, as a tool to evaluate on-shell actions to reproduce. Yeah, I don't think it will be good for any gravitational analysis of scattering or gravitational waves or anything like this. This will fail, of course, because it's bad. As a, yeah. Right, so yes, I, if I kind of orbifold n equals to four and make it into a necklace quiver. Of course, all of this goes true. I pick factors of k from the zk orbifolds and, and it just works in a, in, a, in a boring way, I'd say. So k, right, and, 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 and I don't see that. So this, the differences of the couplings are um, B-field modes on, a, on the 
topological cycles which I um, get from the orbifold. All of these are, <coughs> are kind of outside of supergravity limit, stringy modes, and so I don't see them here. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, any equals one star? <coughs> uh, I don't have a lot, I mean, I, I have a lot, but I don't have a lot of time. Uh, so uh, I've just um, constrained myself to a few comments. Uh, so the, the first thing that you should ask is that it's not obvious that a partition function on S4 is a um, good observable. It, it might just as well be completely scheme dependent, okay? I don't have localization calculations which give me guidance here. So I have to analyze it generally, whether it's a good observable. And so the first thing that people ask is whether the partition function on S4 is a good observable as a function of marginal coupling. So tau and tau bar are labels of the marginal couplings, of the gauge couplings, if you wish. Uh, and it was pointed out in this paper that there's a complete freedom to add to the path integral an arbitrary counterterm with an arbitrary coefficient function of these couplings. So as a function of the, of, of the margin deformations, the free energy is completely scheme dependent. So it's a useless observable, if you wish. Um, however, what we asked is what happens if we add relevant couplings, which, which was the new piece in the analysis, which we did. The calculations are more or less a verbatim uh, repetition of, of the calculations of these authors in some superspace in old minimal rigid supergravity. And what you find is that if you have a mass, let's say, as a relevant deformation, there's only one counter term that depends on the mass, and it's this one. And so what you learn is that if you're interested uh, in the free energy as, as a function of the masses, it's actually good observable if you differentiate enough times to kill this counter term. So this analysis is completely general. It's independent of the bulk dual. It's a QFT statement I'm making here. Okay. Now we applied all of this to n equals four, and in n equals four, I have additional symmetries which restrict the dependence on the masses to, to be either in this quadratic way or in this cubic way. So uh, whatever the function f is for the mass deformation of n equals four, it should be a function of, of exactly these combinations. Okay, so for example, if, if you have an answer for f of s4, and if you want to expand it to quartic order in the mass, it should look like this. It must look like this, according to this analysis above. And so the constants A and B, so, so, so I, I have only two quartic terms allowed by the symmetry, so, and there's a prefactor which is, which is essentially uh, fixed by dimension and a, and, a, and a scaling with N. And so the, the numerical constants A and B are Unambiguous observables in the QFT, I don't know what they mean in flat space, but they're good observables, I claim. So I should be able to compute them. And again, I'm emphasizing that I cannot compute these in any other way, at least as far as I know. So holography is, if you wish, the only way currently that I know how to compute these two constants. Uh, and we did that, and this was even more work, so to capture all of these masses, M1, M2, M3, and allow for a gauge of F and all of that, I have to keep 18 scalars in 5D N equals, four, uh, N equals 8 supergravity. And these 18 scalars uh, um, kind of organize themselves into two vector multiplets and four hypers. And so this model is a consistent truncation of type 2B supergravity on S5. And so if you want, I can give you the model and go analyze it. But we are not that brave because it's a lot of scalars. So we focus on two limits that are somewhat special. Uh, the first one we heard from Costas already in, in the context of flood space. And this is when uh, all of the masses are the same. This is also known as in flood space, this is the GPPZ flow holographically. Here though, I need two more scalars in addition to the ones we heard from Costas. The other one is the flow in which two of the masses vanish and only one is non-zero. This in flat space goes to a fixed point in the IR, strongly coupled fixed point. It was uh, found by 
Ali Strassler, and the bulk deal of that is this famous uh, FGPW solution. So, and again on S4, I need an extra scalar. Okay. So we analyzed these two models in gory detail, numerically, and we computed these two constants, and we computed other things, but I don't have the time to talk about it. So if you wish, we have uh, numerical estimates for the two constants, and they obey a nice uh, sum rule, if you wish, which is imposed essentially by this um, n equals to two supersymmetry. Okay, so we can do calculations in this model on S4 holographically. That's the punchline. Okay, any questions? Right, so it's understood because uh, it's essentially this over two, right? So n equals to two supersymmetry gives you additional constraints between these uh, coefficients, yes. So it's a, it's a special case. Good, so in the next half hour, I'm joking, uh, I will talk about maximal young mills on a sphere, supersymmetric young mills, and an alternative point of view of all of this is that you can think of this as some kind of a, a supergravity solutions describing the near horizon limit of a D brain with a world volume which is a sphere. because we know that maximum young mills lives on the world volume of, uh, of a flat D brain. So this is the spherical version of that in the supergravity approximation, I want to emphasize. So I, I don't know microscopically how to do spherical D brains, but I know in the supergravity limit how to do it. Okay, good. So this is a brief overview of maximum young mills. So the Lagrangian is over here. I have a parameter which I call P, which is the dimension of uh, space and time, and I keep P general. So this thing has 16 supercharges, there's a bunch of scalars in the adjoint and a bunch of fermions in the adjoint and a gauge field. Uh, this Lagrangian can be obtained as a dimensional reduction of a 10D Young Mills on a torus or on some Lorentzian space, and in our case, we insist that we're in Euclidean signature, and so the R symmetry is non-compact, is this one here, okay? And so only for P equals to three, which is D3 brains, if you wish, I have conformal invariance, and this is N equals four and mills, and I'm gonna skip it as an example. I'm interested in non-conformal examples but for this part of the, of the talk. Okay, so I wanna put this on a sphere, and as we know, I have to add extra couplings, and these were worked out by Blau in uh, 2002, I think, or 2004, I'm not sure. And then it was recently, this model was revisited by Minahan and Maxim here uh, in the context of localization. So these two couplings that I have to add, uh, built out of the bosons and the fermions, break this SO1, eight minus P into a subgroup uh, and so, if I want to construct a bulk dual of this, I have to mimic all of this breaking and all of these operators in, in the gravity dual. And this construction works uh, for P up to six, so up to seven dimensional space and time, because essentially, uh, morally speaking, the, the way supersymmetry works on the sphere is by some algebra which is the same as the superconformal algebra in one dimension less, and so I have an upper bound on the dimension in which I have superconformal algebras, which is responsible for this. Okay, and physically, what we're doing is we're taking young mills in flat space, and we're by hand introducing a cutoff, which is the sphere, the length scale of the sphere. However, we're doing it in a very special way, compatible with all of the supercharges. So this is probably the, the unique I are cut off compatible with all supersymmetries. Okay? Good. So I want to construct the bulk dual of this. And so if you are naive, which of course none of you are, but if you were, uh, you would begin in the following way. I know that I want a bulk dual of a theory on S P plus one with 
this much global symmetry, okay? And I should be in type 2a supergravity because I'm dealing with d brains of some sort. And so this is an ansatz for a metric which kind of builds in all of these isometries. So here's the sphere, I'm putting a theory on, here's the radial of ADS, if you wish, and there's the sitter space here which uh, mimics this, and there's another sphere which mimics this. And if I do this, I see that I have another uh, theta angle left over in addition to this R. So all of these functions which I can add in front of, in, in the metric are functions of two variables. And in addition, of course, I have to look at the fluxes and make an ansatz compatible with all of these isometries. And this, of course, will lead you uh, to PDEs. And in addition, you should impose that if you're in the UV, the radius of the sphere should not matter and you're back to the usual flat D-brain solutions. Okay? So if you want to do this, you will stumble upon PDEs necessarily, I claim. And, of course, that's hard. Okay, so there's a better way. And again, I want to, to emphasize Peter and Friedrich. So this was heroic efforts here. Uh, uh, so what, what, what we did actually is to use the fact that in, in these maximally supersymmetric cases, we often, in fact, always have a consistent truncation to some lower dimensional supergravity theory. In, in this case, it's a P plus two dimensional gauge supergravity. And then we can work in there with a bunch of scalars and eventually uplift back to 10 dimensions. So that will be the strategy here. So uh, uh, I just want to emphasize that we have in the, in the deformation of the Lagrangian, we have these couplings morally. We have these two kind of operators, which I had to add on the sphere. This one, of course, is there in flat space, but the coefficient is dimension full, so it runs. So in the bulk, if you wish, I have to add a diloton capturing the running of the gauge coupling. So I'm looking for a model which has scalars corresponding to each of these operators in the bulk, and which breaks SO18 minus P to this subgroup. So that's my goal. And so the question is, Thank you. Do, do I have supergravity theories which have this content? Can I do this is, is the question. That's the goal. And you, you can do it. Not only can you do it, it's kind of nice. So after a lot of work and digging through Baroque papers from 85, uh, altered by uh, the, the person who this institute is named after, uh, you can distill this model. So the, the model comes out of a consistent truncation of a maximum supergravity theory in P plus two dimensions for P, six, five, four, two, and one. Uh, and, and it looks like this. It has two scalars, tau and tau tilde, and it has another one, lambda, and, and it has a potential which is determined in terms of a superpotential in the usual way, and that's the superpotential. It has a slight difference between uh, these values of P, but basically that's the model that you have to play. Super simple. Uh, and I want to emphasize that when P is equal to six, I actually don't have this scalar lambda at all in the Lagrangian. I have only two scalars. Okay, and the model when P is equal to one, so D1, brains is new. We, we just couldn't find it in the literature, but we postulated it and it works. So it must be true. Good. In the flat space limit, these two scalars are gone and I, I, and I have the usual diloton and metric, the one that you studied with Townsend. It, it, yeah, it's exactly this section. So if you wish, I'm adding two more scalars to your story, okay? Good, so with this, Model, I have an ansatz for all of the fields. Again, spherically symmetric ansatz, so I have a metric function A, and all of the scalars are functions of, of the radial variable, and I get some DPS equations of this form, which I have to solve. Okay, I'm out of time, basically, but let me kind of explain what we did. Uh, so for all of these values of P, we can have a solution. Uh, for P, one, two, four, and six, it's analytic, and for 
equals to five is numerical. We couldn't integrate the BPS equations analytically, but for all of the cases, the picture is this one. So in the, in the IR, I have a smooth capping off of the geometry because I'm on a sphere. This is, if you wish, the manifestation of the cutoff in the field theory. In the UV, I'm, I don't have anti Sitter space, of course. I'm not conformal. So in the UV, you kind of approach these backgrounds which describe D brains in type two string tip. Okay? And so I have a, a flow which kind of interpolates between these two. And all of these uh, backgrounds, which we have in the paper, depend on one constant only. In the Lagrangian, I have only one dimension less constant, which is this combination of the Young Mills coupling, which is dimension full, and the radius of the sphere. So in the bulk, I should see only one integration constant in my models, and indeed I do, this lambda i r. Okay? It's the value of the scalar lambda at this point here, if you wish. That's how we parameterize it. Okay, so after this, this is so in the lower d supergravity, I have to uplift it, and again, there was some heroic effort, because now I have to go back and dig out from the supergravity literature uplift formulae, and you have to go back some years and so on, but that's the answer basically. So I'm back to my naive expectation that I started with, except that now I have an explicit function for these p and q and uh, lambda and so on. So we know these backgrounds uh, kind of explicitly with all of the fluxes. Okay, and it's a full one half BPS backgrounds in, uh, in 10 d supergravity. And there's a curiosity with the six brains, but I don't have the time to talk about it. So if you have a background like this, you can aim at doing holography with it. Uh, but the background is not asymptotically ADS, so I cannot just open the books and read about it. I have to be a bit more inventive. Uh, but but I, I have to do it in a sense, because I know that there's localization results for this model on a sphere, which were uh, uh, worked out by Joe Minahan, Anton Nedelin, and Maxim uh, in various papers. And the point is that the, the partition function is, is a function only of, of this lambda, which is now dimension pool, this coupling lambda, because I have an energy scale, right? I don't have a conformal theory. And they, uh, you can aim at calculating it. Um, and unfortunately, now I have to understand how the energy scale in the QFT is related to the radium coordinate in the bulk, which is a subtle issue, and there could be constant coefficients, which I don't know about, and I have to learn how to regularize this on-shell action without having asymptotically ADS spaces and so on. So uh, qualitatively, the answer is over here. So we managed to avoid all of these issues and find the scaling of the free energy holographically with N and this lambda. It's a function of P. Uh, but we were not able, when we published the paper, to compute the coefficient. Uh, currently, we're working with Anton and Joe uh, on computing these coefficients, both in holography and in localization. And holographically, what's useful is this paper of Costas and Marika uh, on how to do regularization, if you wish, on, of, of on shell actions in the context of non conformal brains, which is what, what we're doing here. Excellent question. P equals to five is a mystery of the universe, right? Because we have D5 and NS5 brains, in, and in the UV, I have a little string theory. So this divergence, we really don't understand in QFT. The putative answer is that it has to do with little string theory, but I, I, I don't know more. So obviously, this is not valid for P equals five. Right, so the, the calculation which we did for the on-shell action also breaks at p equals five. So this formula should best be viewed as breaking down for p equals five and, and we need a new analysis. 
which currently we don't know how to do. Yeah, it's the usual linear dilaton stuff of, yeah, little string theory. Okay. Okay, so summary, uh, what I've done is to construct uh, solutions of type two supergravity, which are, are dual to massive deformations of n equals to four on S4. And we demonstrated agreement between localization and holography for the case of n equals to two. For n equals one, we don't have localization formulas, but we can compute on the supergravity side with a bit of work. And then I demonstrated also how to extend all of this for um, maximally supersymmetric young bills in uh, p plus one dimensions. Okay, so some future work that I think has to be done. So some of it we're doing here. We can extend this um, calculation of a Wilson line to our other representations of the gauge group, which means that you, you should be looking not at probe fundamental strings, but D brain probes. Uh, as I mentioned, we're uh, uh, working on uh, understanding this on shell action for the case of maximum Young Mills, both in holography and in localization. And one can do similar uh, constructions for um, three dimensional conformal theories and deformations thereof. And this is work I'm doing on Krzysztof. Uh, okay, and then the, these are more ambitious questions, which I think you should think about, but I'm not gonna uh, keep you any longer. I'm going to finish here. Thank you very much.